Hi, everybody. Welcome. Splits and swarms and castles, oh my. The way we're going to work this is I'm going to do the first half of this. Bob's going to do the second half. Both of us are going to chime in when we think one of us has missed something. Uh, one quick thing about the presentation is the slides are fairly verbose, but we're not going to read from the slides. But assuming while we're talking, you can scan them and then come back later when we post them up uh, if you want to rewatch the presentation. All right. To our regularly scheduled program, uh, swarm prevention, know-how. We'll talk about trigger swarm management prevention. We'll talk about how to do splits. Also, queen castles. If you don't know what that is, we'll explain. And then uh, Bob is going to cover high swarm traps and a couple other things like cutouts and such. Uh, from swarm prevention, you know, the, the first thing to say is, why is this such a big deal? This time of year, you always hear beekeepers talking about it. Primarily, there's two major reasons. One, if your bees fly away, there's less bees to make honey for you. And two, if they end up in your neighbor's house, in their soffit or in their chimney or something like that, that's a headache you don't really need. Um, people outside of the beekeeping community, when they see a swarm, don't usually understand it. They feel terrorized when they see thousands of bees. And, you know, ideally, as good neighbors, we want to be uh, ones that prevent swarms and should practice swarm management. So what is swarming? Gene kind of talked on it earlier. It's the natural and instinctive behavior of the bees to reproduce. A single bee cannot make a colony. It has to be the superorganism. So they cast off half of the superorganism that restarts a new colony. Swarm timing is an important thing to understand here. And our branch hosted a statewide survey for a couple of years just to ask people, when do you see swarms? When are you getting reports of swarms? After collecting for a couple of years, we confirmed what a lot of people knew is it's tax day. April 15th tends to be in earnest the start of swarm season. Now, some springs run a week early, some springs run a week late, but generally that first or second week in April is when it kicks off. Uh, that's an important milestone, put a pin in that, is that if you understand when swarms generally start, you can know when to look for them in earnest, meaning when they're getting started in your colony. The other thing to just quick note here before we move off the slide is, 4th of July is usually when it tapers off. Uh, once you get into the beginning of July, the forage in New Jersey tends to taper off and the pressures of your hive swarming out of the box goes away. And the last thing to say, and we'll cover more of what this means is, swarms are gonna follow the biology of the bees. They have to have the right conditions. So triggers and conditions are indicators that swarm preps underway. And remember what I said, April 15th, 10 to 20 days prior to the swarm season is when you should see things happening in your hives. Uh, somebody recently posted something on Facebook that they opened their hive and they saw queen cells, which I find astonishing. And they were in New Jersey. I don't know whether they read that wrong or uh, it just seems too cold and too early yet for that to be there. But if you look down at the bottom, the last clause is every colony is like a child and some of them <laughs> do things differently. Uh, they're just swarmy by nature and maybe that one wants a head start. The reality is you need to go in your hives, read the signs, and then understand what comes next. You have to know that in order for a hive to swarm, it has to have specific things. It's got to be a working established colony. It has to have a mix of bees. There has to be drones in there. Why does there have to be drones? Because the queen leaves with the swarm. That's the way it works. And when the queen leaves, she's going to leave her daughters in charge. When her daughters emerge, they are virgins and they have to go out and get mated. For them to get mated, there has to be drones. So nature has put into play this whole biological thing that all of these things happen in succession so that when the swarm occurs, the daughters can go get mated. Okay, so obviously you need to have drones. And you need to have daughters in order for the swarm to emerge. They won't do it without it. And then, of course, they need bees to go. 
and start the new colony. They wouldn't leave without a sufficient amount and they need bees to stay to take over the operation when everybody leaves. If you read your colonies at this time of year, you either have a dink, a medium, or a booming hive. If it's dink or medium, meaning something that's small and doesn't have all the things we just said on the previous slide, then maybe you don't have a concern or maybe it's going to build a little later in the season to swarm. But if you have a booming colony, which, you know, if you look at the purplish, you know, sometimes you open hives in the beginning of April and they come bubbling out and they're all over the place. You're going to need to do some sort of swarm prevention techniques. Well, that's how we split and we get more hives. When you have a trigger, this is something that you as a beekeeper can look for and understand that, you know, with these things, present swarming will come. The, the biggest and obvious sign is crowding. Crowding comes in two forms, bees and resources. But sometimes, and this is something that new beekeepers are generally not aware of, and even sometimes seasoned beekeepers, it's the workers who drive swarm impulse. The queen may go lay new daughters and everything, but it's the workers that generate the vibe inside the hives to say, okay, everybody, some of you have got to go. We're going to prep for swarming. There's chemical communication breakdown with massive amounts of bees in there. The queen's pheromone's not getting around. Her footprint pheromone is not there. There's also just simple genetics. Uh, you know, when we went to Africa, they don't worry about anything because if a hive swarmed away, they know that another one's going to move right in after it. Our bees are not that swarmy, but some of the races that we do carry do have swarmy tendencies. And then there's just the simple point of nature, warmer days and longer sunshine available to them. To talk about crowding, and some of these I, I said I wasn't going to go in detail, but I'll go a little bit enough so you grasp the concepts of them. There's simply just too many bees in the box. And bees move around inside, they encounter other bees. And when they're constantly bouncing off of each other, they've got no place to work. They have to wait for somebody to get out of the way before they could put honey in a cell, things like that. Somebody's got to go. The other side of it is if they bring stuff back and they are fervent when forage is available to make hay and there's no place to put it, they're going to put it in every cell that's available to them. What you're looking at here is a brood area where the holes should be filled with eggs as they emerge, but the bees are putting nectar in them because they have no place to store. You didn't give them enough storage. So both the sheer quantity of bees, congestion, and the lack of space for bees that are trying to be employed to do what they need to do are triggers that swarming needs to occur. When we talked about worker motivations, um, it's one of those things that if you think about, well, what do bees do? There's 21 jobs in the hive. You know, they feed the, the new bees, they clean up, there's undertaker bees, there's receiver bees and forager bees. If there's idle bees, because there's just so many bees that there's not enough work for those bees, the idle bees are going to send signals we need to swarm. We'd be better off going off and building a new colony. Um, there's, there's just different things that we as humans can't observe, but it's all going on in there. And this is where the take, the takeaway is a complex ecosystem. The workers actually have quite a bit to do with when the swarm takes off. And one of the things that holds a colony together is the queen's pheromone. It's the glue that lets everybody know we're one big happy family. And when there's so many bees that the queen's pheromone don't make it around to all the bees. And also she relies on the pheromone going out to the bees and coming back to her. That little key is one of the things that causes maybe the queen to go lay her daughters. They don't quite understand that yet, but they feel like that might be one of the things where if the queen doesn't uh, get her pheromone coming back to her from her court, then she may go lay daughters because there's just an overabundance. If I think about uh, indicators, too many bees, queen cells, presence of them, this is you knowing flag is blowing. You should understand flags in the wind. We're going to have a swarm here. 
you're looking at a box that has congestion. You're looking at a box, you're seeing queen cells. You're looking at a box and there's just tons and tons of drones being built. There's white wax. Maybe you know in the back of your head, your queen is old. Older queens tend to be a little more swarmy. She's a second year or third year queen. One late sign that you could see is the listlessness. When everybody's taking a pause inside the colony because they're chowing down, they need to feed before they leave in case when they fly out, they don't go directly to their house. They can sustain themselves until they get to their nest. You'll, you'll know that a hive that was booming yesterday all of a sudden is quiet. And then the following day, it's going to swarm. That's a very late stage. Now, one thing I want you to know about white wax. At six days of age, a young bee will develop its, lens, its uh, wax glands. When you have the queen laying like crazy from February, March, April, and there's tons of new bees, you're going to have a large set, subset of bees that are six days old and their wax glands have developed. That's great for the swarm that leaves because they'll be able to build the comb in the new home. But when they're in a colony that has 20 frames of comb already and everything's built out, they're going to start depositing that wax all over and you'll see white wax deposits on top of the frames. And sometimes on the margins and sometimes up in, you know, against the uh, inner cover and such. You know that you have prime condition of all these young bees that are ready to go out to swarm. Those are all indicators. If you know you have congestion and indicators and all of these things, then you should be taking action. And the question is, and we'll pivot now to what can you do? And we'll go through this list of techniques for I see all these signs and I need to do something about it to prevent it. The first thing is coming out of winter. This is a very customary thing to do. The brood will move up into the top box. And in order for them not to seem crowded, you want to do a reversal. You simply just take the top box, pull it off, pull the bottom box off the bottom board, put the top box on the bottom board and return the bottom box over top of it, spring reversal. Now, a lot of times people ask, when should this be done? I've been waiting for the first account of somebody telling me they've already done this. I heard it yesterday. <laughs> it's a little early. If you get to the days where it's 45 degrees and colder at night, the bees are, will cluster. They'll come together to try and stay warm. So what I like to say is I look at the weather, and when I see those days where I have overnights that are warmer than 40, 45 degrees, then I might consider this. The, the penalty for doing the switch is you break all the seals. And when it's cold, the bees can't repair the propolis that seals the boxes out that prevents the drafts from coming through. Now, somebody told me last night, and I was trying to find that before it got jumped in here. We have a 20 degree night on a forecast coming up. It's still going to be pretty cold in the next couple of days. So be careful with those. Now, Gene talked about this earlier. If you have a brood chamber, a nest that is big enough coming out of winter that it spans into the bottom box, don't split it. Now, I want you to condition, consider the condition on the right-hand side where if you split it and you had some of the brood nests in the top of the box and you got that 20 degree day, anything that was going on up there, those bees are gonna retreat and come down to the mass at the brood and leave whatever it is up there to die. So the better idea is to do this. If they're split across the boxes, as much as we like to say bees build up, they will build down, they will build whatever space, just leave them be. Don't do a reversal. Okay. This is a brood expansion measure. If you are facing a massive colony right from the get-go and you want to do something about it, you can make the brood nest three boxes. You're just simply going to add another box. And if you want to entice them to, you know, have a little more space, you can bring every other frame up. This is one option. 
uh, you know, this shows every other frame and the bees will pass through. This is something you might do a little bit later in the spring. The better option would be this one, the pyramid approach. The reason being is you're taking some of the outside frames of that really congested box and you're putting them up above. Here, if it's a little bit cooler, the heat is going to transcribe right up through the center of the box. And it'll keep the center frames warmer. And if you happen to have some of those off nights where it's 20 degrees, 30 degrees, this colony on the right would do a little bit better. Either one of them are perfectly viable though for a spring approach. Now, sometimes when you have a massive hive on the right and sitting right next to it is a hive that didn't do so well, the other thing that you could do to relieve some of the pressure is just swap some of the frames between them. Take brood, in all stages bias without the queen of course and give it to the hive on the left and take the frames that you put them in and move them over to the right now when you're moving things out of the right side hive consolidate everything to the middle and do the same thing on the left side hive. try to consolidate the brood towards the center of the box so that it can maintain the heat through the middle but equalization is another opportunity and what this does is it relieves the congestion and all the other stuff that we talked about in the right side hive. And it props up the one on the left to help them in cooler conditions. And they may take off better if they have more resources. In the same way that you have hive congestion, you may have honey storage congestion. I went through a couple of my hives and they still have 60 pounds of honey in them. Cap frames, four, five, six frames of cap both sides. Before the nectar flow starts, now right now you have goldenrod, no, sorry, you have uh, crocus out there, you have snowdrops, you see pussy willow is bloomed. Um, they do have some nectar, but that's not the same thing as an apple tree bloom and tree buds going on. That's right around the corner. Before that occurs, you want to put the honey boxes on and give them a chance to explore the space. Preferably you have drawn comb up there for honey supers. But this is advisable pretty soon, like 1st of April, if not sooner. One of the indicator plants in our area is forsythia. If you drive all over the place, even though the bees don't use it, that's, that's when, it, when game is on in New Jersey. And if you're going to add this, uh, do consider an upper entrance so that if they're going to use that top storage area, they can come right in and go right up into the honey area. They don't have to come into the main entrance and walk through the brood chamber, which is congestion and a swarm problem, right? Another indicator. So give them an upper entrance. There's another similar technique to just giving them space called checkerboarding. It takes off on the thing we saw a little bit earlier, put a honey box on and move every other honey frame up. This opens channels through the honey dome and it also puts honey up in the top box and entices the bees to come up and build that box out with honey. You do this again right when the, the nectar flow is going to start. Evan, does, those new frames, does it matter if they have comb or not? Uh, you know, if you did have comb on them, like what you see here, um, that would be better. So you want to think about the nurse bees are primarily going to hang down into the nest. And if you want to build comb foundation, you would put it down somewhere in the vicinity of the nest, not up in the honey box. But when you have a plethora of bees and they're the right age, they'll build comb in any place you have. So if you need to get your honey supers built out, you know, your best friend is when, it, when it's game on and the trees are in bud, they'll build comb out just because they, they want the comb. Thanks. Yeah. This technique is called checkerboarding. It was invented by Walter Wright. You can go look that up. He tells you specifically how it all works, how to do it, the timing, and so on. Now, if you get partway through the season and they filled the, the top box, you put one on, you could do it all through the season. Don't think it's just a, a early spring thing. You could do it all year long. Now, the other thing you could do, obviously, is just 
take the box away and go harvest it and put a new box on and let them have at it. I want to talk about relieving congestion pressure by doing a split. This is the everyday bread and butter. This is how you do a split. A lot of people are mystified by this. It's not complicated. You're going to take, in this case, I'm showing you're doing a nuke. Now, I'm going to say split, and I'm going to refer to it as an artificial swarm. What you're trying to emulate here is a swarm has left the main colony. But before the swarm flies away from you, you're taking it and putting it in a box. Now, if you think what leaves when a swarm leaves, the queen leaves, and a mix of bees, young and old. Now, they don't have resources where they're going, but you have a leg up because you can take resources and stock them and also pull new brood. So when you want to make a split, go through your colony and find your queen and take her to the nuke, just like nature. Ideally, you'd find a frame or two of brood to help them get started with their population. You'd give them some honey so they have carbohydrate, and you'd give them some pollen. Now, some people think I need a pure honey frame and a poor, pure pollen frame. You don't. You need a frame that has honey and pollen. If they're mixed together, that's perfectly fine too. Now, in the picture there, you see the looking at the nuke. Um, can you see my mouse? Anybody? Yep. Yep. Yeah, we can okay. see mouse. <clears throat> this frame is empty. You could put an empty frame in for growth, or you could put drawn comb in, whatever you want to do. Some people, when they pull a nuke, uh, give them empty space so that they can grow into it. Your choice as to how you want to accommodate that. So this is just a simple everyday basic split. Now, if you think about the way the world works and you have one of these booming hives and you're in there looking for days to try and find the queen or you're not great at finding queen or you know, even seasoned beekeepers in the spring with a box loaded can't find it, there's an easier way. And there was just a study done saying raising uh, queens this way is actually fairly effective, meaning the quality of the queen. I have box one and box two on the left-hand side. I simply take box two off, put it on a new bottom board, and I put the roof on it. Now, in this case, the queen happened to be in box two, so that one gets the queen. On the one on the left, no queen, but presumably, if the thing is loaded with a plethora of bees, you have brood operating in the box, and they'll make themselves a queen. So if you're not good at finding a queen colony, you have our permission to go ahead and do what's called a walkaway split. Easiest way to go. You want to do this early so that the time it takes for the queen to, you know, be cultured by the bees go out get mated and come back and start that colony which is colony one happens during the nectar flow so that you know as the nectar flow goes through to july they have enough time to build up to something that can overwinter they may even make you honey if you do it early so this is you know generally like first week in april second week in april when the hive is fully full you don't want to do it in, you know, late May. Okay. I want to talk real quick about a queen castle. Um, just a quick introduction before I talk about how to use one. You see, it's a normal box. Sometimes people be, build dedicated hardware. They cut channels in it and they put dividers. The dividers run from the floor to the ceiling. Each one of the chambers that gets created has an entrance. If you're looking at the top picture on the right, this is an entrance and that's an entrance. And that hole is the entrance for this chamber out the back. These holes are screened and they're for ventilation. And you put the lids on. 
the concept of this is you have three separate colonies living in one box. If you see these in catalogs or custom made, this one happened to be a picture off of B source. Um, they come in three and four, usually compartments. The way you use this for swarm management is let's say you're too late. You went into your colony, you didn't get into it, and you found queen cells all over the place. You're going to go and take your queen cells out and distribute them into your queen castle. You can give them two, three, whatever you find. The thing that you don't want to do is leave any queen cells in the mother colony. When you're done, it looks like this. The queen castle gets queen cells drawn or started on the right side, one, two, three, however many you give them, plus resources, similar to making the nuke. And you've stripped out nine frames out of the mother colony. Hopefully you can replace them with drawn comb. That's not too dissimilar than uh, artificial swarm with the exception of one thing, the queen is still there. So you say to yourself, well, won't the queen swarm? The concept here is remember they needed all those specific conditions. They needed lots of bees and lots of brood and you've just stripped them of major amount of resources. You've taken them from a booming colony to a runty colony or a moderate colony. And if the queen has room for expansion and the bees aren't crowded, the assumption is when you do this, that colony, the mother colony, will just get back to work and replenish itself. They won't swarm away. Now, if you did this really late and the queen was, you know, dead set to swarm, she might swarm. Then what you probably have to do is take one of those colonies that you built over there in your queen castle and put it back in the mother colony when the time comes now one of the things about this colony is it shows it's still in the same boxes because of the diagram but you could take it down to one box after you strip it of all its resources you could even reduce it down to a nuke which is pretty common it just depends on what you leave them with in the time of year and conditions <sighs> Now to talk about a queen castle, this is actually what they were invented for, a more traditional approach. This is not swarm control. This is queen rearing. You're gonna go over to the colony on the left. You're gonna pull out a frame of brood. You're gonna harvest larva and you're gonna put them in a queen building device, this guy. They're gonna build new queen uh, cells for you and you're gonna load the queen cells over into the queen castle. So to be clear, to use the queen castle for swarm prevention is unorthodox use of it. It's true purpose in life is for grafting queens and doing queen rearing. Just wanted to make sure you knew that. One last thing about a technique. Uh, you heard this mentioned earlier again from uh, the presentation, the De Marie method and or the Snellgrove. They're pretty complicated. There are multiple steps and there's also a lot of variations of how they work. The general gist is you take the queen cells and you put them up in a colony above the master and you either manipulate them by killing them or you let them go and you create a second colony. There's a steps. If you want to look it up, you can find it. I'm, I'm just showing you the picture here so that you know this is a swarm technique, swarm prevention technique. And if you know what you're doing, this is a pretty effective thing to do. All's well and good until one gets away. If you come in and you find out that your colony has swarmed, you just got to keep an eye on it. Nature has a way of reproducing itself. And in theory, your colony should be perfectly fine. It's just going to get stunted a little bit. The new queens will be reared, they'll go out, get mated, they'll come back, they'll start laying and everything kicks off again. You need to though, make sure that you keep an eye on that colony and inspect it occasionally to ensure that the queen did get mated and that you start to see eggs and the colony comes back to right. If in time, the colony population starts to dwindle, you can wait and be really kind of lag on this, but eventually you're going to have to take action and supply them a queen. If you don't, you're going to get a 
drone laying community and you know, you'll have a mess on your hands. Don't be surprised if this colony that swarmed all of a sudden starts packing in resources. If they don't have bees that are taking care of brood and doing whatever, and the nectar flow is on, they'll, they'll start going out like crazy and getting things. So I know uh, we went through all that process. What I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Bob and we'll take questions at the end, unless anybody has a burning question um, that has to get answered right now. I'll, I'll run the show for you, Bob. Great, thanks, Kevin. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, collecting swarms. Collecting swarms is one of the most fun parts of beekeeping um, for a couple of reasons. One, it's free bees. That's the best part. Uh, number two is the bees are usually very docile. And number three, it's a great opportunity to interact with people and teach them about bees. So if you want to catch swarms, you need to be on the uh, swarm lifts. When you sign up for New Jersey Beekeepers Association, they ask you if you want to collect swarms and where you want to collect them and how high and that kind of stuff. And they also ask you if you want to do cutouts. So uh, you can put whatever you want in there. And if you go to the uh, Central Beekeep Beekeepers Association, the Central Branch, that's where the uh, swarm list is. So you, all you do is you type in a county and it gives you a list of uh, people that are there. So if you wanna collect swarms, make sure you get on the list. All right, next, Kevin. Okay, pre-plan. So during swarm season, basically I have everything that I need to catch swarms in my truck because you wanna get there and you wanna get there as soon as possible. So just all the things we talked about, uh, a bee brush, a ladder, vac, my bee vac, everything you have. Most important thing when, when you get a, a swarm call, the first thing you need to do is ask people, send me a photo. And, and why is that? It's because most people don't know the difference between bees and wasps, right? So you don't wanna go running all the way out there and find out it's a yellow jacket nest or a bald-faced hornet's nest, right? So ask for a photo just to make sure that they're honeybees or ask them where they are. If they tell you they're in the ground, they're probably not honeybees, right? Okay, next, Kevin. As I said before, this is a, a really an opportunity for you to be an ambassador for bees and beekeeping. And you have to remember you're on somebody's private property right? So you have to have to be careful, tread lightly, tell them what you're going to do, explain to them what that the, about the bees and what the bees are trying to do, and do as little damage as possible. Sometimes when you're collecting swarms, if they're hanging on a branch, the easiest thing to do is cut that branch off and shake them down into a box. Um, and that may be an easy thing to do, but it would be nice if you ask the homeowner before you go trimming their trees, right? Um, I always carry extra equipment, veils, a couple of jackets, gloves. And so if you want, just suit, suit up the homeowners and take them along with you. The bees are very gentle when they're swarming. And uh, again, it's a great opportunity to educate people about bees and beekeeping. So you get there, they are honeybees, You've, you know that, you've got everything that you need. Okay, what am I gonna do? Um, I carry a couple of different size containers. I put most of, most of them into a five frame nuke, but sometimes the swarms are so big that you really need 10 frames. And I'll give you an example. I got a call for a swarm at Valley Crest Farm a couple of years ago thing was, was pretty big. It was in a peach tree, it was easy. Got it right down into a nuke. The bees walked right into the box. I went home, I figured I'd come back later to collect them and they were gone. Why? That five frame nuke was not big enough to hold that huge swarm. And they got in there, said, this is not enough room and they left. So anyway, plan out what you wanna do. 
uh, tell the homeowners what you're doing. And what you want to do is figure out how am I going to get close to this cluster of bees? You know, are they 15 feet off the ground? Are they on the ground? Are they on a, uh, a wall? Are they on a tree? On a mailbox? I've gotten a couple of calls for swarms on mailboxes. So here's some examples. Got one where they're really high up in the tree. I love the one on the bottom left with Kevin. Call that the puddle swarm. All right, these bees were on the ground. All right, sometimes they just cling on to the tree. Other times you have to climb up the ladder and again, cut the branch and carry it down with you. So what you're trying to do with a swarm is you wanna get the bees and especially the queen into some sort of a vessel, whether that's a cardboard box or whether it's a tub or ideally it's a, uh, a hive, a beehive with some frames in it. So there are different ways to do it. Um, you can vacuum them, you can shake them down. Sometimes you have to, have to use a ladder. Other times you can uh, use a, uh, a container that's on a, uh, a pole. Um, another thing is you can do is you can use a uh, gold comb. If you can't get too clean, say you can't get a bucket up to where they are, if you can get a piece of comb up into that swarm, they'll walk right onto that old comb and you'll bring them down. Okay, we're gonna, we'll talk about cutouts a little bit later. So the most important thing with a swarm is what? You wanna make sure you get the queen and you wanna to try to get as many of the bees as you can. You wanna get them home and you wanna put them into a hive. Okay, next. So here's a uh, picture. Uh, as I said, you can use any container. This happens to be <clears throat> a plastic container. So you're just gonna get them down into that and then you're gonna put them into a hive. Other times, like the bottom picture, you're gonna shake them directly into the, the hive that has comb in it. And if you look at that swarm, the, the queen is right in the middle of there, right? She's in the center. Sometimes she's walking on the outside, but most of the time she's buried in there pretty deeply. So when you drop that swarm down, the queen's gonna fall down with them. One of the things you can do to prevent the bees from flying is spray them with a little bit of sugar water. Uh, it does a couple of things. They start grooming each other a little bit, but it also, the main thing is it really prevents them from flying. And they'll, when you shake them, they'll come down in a big clump. Next. Uh, yeah, so sometimes it are harder than others. Uh, when it's up against a tree like this, this would be an ideal place if you had a vacuum to vacuum them off. But if you don't have a vacuum, you take your brush out and you brush them into a container. The bottom one is uh, our past president, Jim McCauley, hiving a pretty good sized swarm where he just clipped the branch off and he's about to shake it down. He'll probably just take that whole branch and just set it down, doesn't even have to shake it. Just put it right into the hive and let the bees walk onto the comb. Next. So here's a, a couple of different ones. This is uh, a container that's on the end of a pole. You can see how, how high you can get with that. You don't have to be on a ladder. Um, again, one of, one of the main things about swarms is, listen, it's not worth breaking your back to catch a swarm of bees, okay? And I've been there and I've done that. You know, I've really done some things to catch bees that probably wasn't the smartest thing in the world to do. So remember, they're just bees. And if you're gonna put yourself at risk of serious injury by trying to go up way up on a ladder to catch the bees, think twice about it. Come up with a gadget like uh, we have here. Most important thing, like I said, is to get the uh, queen in the box. Uh, once you get them in, her in the box, the bees will start scenting. The bottom picture here, you can see they put their little butts up in the air. That exposes the uh, Nazanoff gland. They give off a pheromone that basically says to the other bees, hey, come on over here. Queen is over here. This is where we're going. 
Next, it, once you get the queen in the box, and this is one of the coolest things about catching swarms is the bees will walk right in. So these bees are in motion. They're just, the queen is in the box and these bees are just walking right into the box for you. It's one of the really coolest things to see, one of the bee behaviors. Rather than fly in, they just walk in. Okay. Now you get them home, what are you gonna do with them? You know, your main concern is that you don't want them leaving the box because they don't like, for whatever reason, they don't like it, right? You want them to stay. So the important thing is to make sure you close up the box before you get it home. Wanted to talk a little bit about ventilation because I'm going to confess one of my sins last year. I caught a swarm, a good sized swarm. Um, it was about the middle of July. It was really pretty hot out. And uh, I put it into a box and it had a, it had a little screened opening in the top and it had a little screen opening in the bottom. And I thought it had enough ventilation. Uh, I put it in my garage because it was late in the evening and I was gonna install it the next day. And when I went in the next day, guess what? That swarm was, was dead. They just didn't have enough ventilation. So on the left, you can see this is a bucket that I made where I put some uh, hardware cloth on the top, make sure that they have enough ventilation because it's important, especially if it's later on in the year. Okay, next. Yeah, so you wanna make sure you get them home. There may be a few buzzing around in the, uh, in the car with you. It depends uh, what your tolerance is. If uh, you can't stand the bees <laughs> buzzing around you, you can always stop, open the door and let them go. Um, so again, most of the time they're up against the back window and it's not a problem. But if there's really a lot of them, uh, you may even wanna put a suit on yeah, you'll get some funny looks when you stop at a red light and people look over at you, but uh, at least you'll be safe from the bees. Next. All right. So you want to put the bees where you're going to leave them, right? Because they're going to orient to that stop, to that spot. Um, the best thing to do is keep them closed up for a little while and open them up at night when they're not going to fly. Because then they're in there overnight they get accustomed to it and they're gonna stay. One of the best things you can do, a surefire way of making sure that they don't abscond is to put a frame of eggs and brood in there because they will not leave the brood, okay? So you wanna make sure, you know, after all this effort that you put in to get these bees and you get them home, last thing you want is to go, go out there tomorrow and see that the bees have left, they've absconded because they didn't like whatever, uh, whatever box you gave them. Next, you have to just leave them alone for a while, let them get used to their new home. Um, you know, you wanna see, you gotta remember that this, the bees at this point are really primed for making wax, okay? That's what, what they wanna do. And so if you want to get comb drawn, the best thing you can do is put some foundation in there and these bees will draw that foundation out in no time. Uh, if you got to make sure you have the queen, because uh, if you don't, you're going to have to introduce another queen, okay? So you want to make sure there's evidence that she's laying, either you see her or you see eggs and young brood. Cutouts. Wait, I'll just chime in here and say, yes. sometimes you grab a swarm and what we said is the queen leaves and takes the swarm. But sometimes after swarms leave with virgins, mm -hmm. they don't have mated queens. And so when that colony gets in and <clears throat> you think you have a colony with a queen and it takes forever, be patient. Uh, you may have a queenless hive because the queen has to go out and get mated first. Yeah, so especially in uh, secondary swarms, a lot of times you'll see there'll be multiple virgin queens and I've caught swarms that had, have had as many as five virgin queens in them. Okay, so great point, Kevin. Next. Cutouts. So we look at it, you get there, 
and it's not a swarm. The bees are going through a little hole in the wall. You have to pull the wall apart to get them. You really have to say to yourself, is this something that I am able to do? Okay, cutouts are a really specialized operation and you can do a lot of damage to a house if you really don't know what you're doing. So my two cents is, and, and I've, I've done probably less than five cutouts in my, my career so far, more like two or three. And that's just because they were really, really easy ones. Or I did one in, in a house that was gonna be demolished anyway. Um, but you have to think twice about cutouts. What you want to do is uh, leave this for the professionals, leave this for people that know what they're doing, because you're going to be cutting into somebody's house and, uh, you know, you need to find out where the bees are and make sure that you can get them out. So uh, usually I refer them to Bee Man Rob. We have a couple of other people in the club that, uh, that do cutouts and uh, leave this for the professionals. Swarm traps, my favorite thing. So rather than chasing swarms, it's really great when they just move in. So you put some swarm traps out. Uh, I actually had two hives last year that were abandoned that, uh, that hives just moved, excuse me, swarms just moved right into. So there were two I didn't even have to catch. Um, but consider putting a couple out. You don't have to put 30 out like some of these people do, but put one in your, in your yard, in your yard or a uh, hundred yards or so away. And uh, you might be lucky and catch a swarm. I've caught a couple in my own yard. Best thing is about a hundred yards. Uh, Sorry, you need some know. old comb. You just need a, a frame or two of old comb in the box. The box that they, uh, the size that Sealy recommended was, is about uh, 10 gallons or 40 liters, which is about the size of a deep box. We were talking before about what would you do with your deep boxes if you convert it to all mediums? Well, the best thing you could do is make swarm traps out of them. They're ideal. Slap a piece of plywood on the bottom, cover on the top, drill a hole through the side. You put a couple of pieces of old, the raunchiest, darkest old comb that you have, spray a little bit of uh, Swarm Commander or lemongrass oil. Uh, and again, more is not better in this, in this situation. So if you're gonna use these Swarm Lures or you're gonna use lemon oil, excuse me, any kind of the uh, lemon oils, uh, just a little bit. If you put too much in, it actually acts as a repellent to the bees. And people say, well, where should, where should I put it? Uh, some people will tell you it has to be high up in the air, 10 feet in the air, 15 feet in the air. Um, my experience has been that it doesn't really matter where you put it up or, or down. Um, my good friend, Kevin here, he has a swarm trap that he's never set out sitting in the breezeway between his house and his garage on the ground. And he's had swarms move into it four years in a row. Okay, so on the ground, I've caught swarms on equipment that's you know a foot off the ground. So don't try to kill yourself by putting it 15 feet up in the air and then having to retrieve it with a ladder or whatever. Whatever height is convenient for you, uh, just set it out there. The other thing is you say, well, where should I put it? Well, put it where you've caught swarms before or you've seen swarms before because the bees like to go back to these places. So once you put a swarm trap out and you catch a swarm in it, put another one there and put one there the next year because the chances are you'll catch it, you'll catch swarms every year there. Next, lots of plans on the uh, internet. Uh, Jason Bruns is kind of the master of uh, swarm trapping. He puts out, I think, 35 or 40 of these a year, and he catches probably 25 or 30 a year. So there's lots of plans out there. I think you can make about four out of a sheet of plywood. I think, Kevin, that's what we did one year. Yep. And uh, 
again, it's really easy to do. Like I said, deep boxes, you know, your, your old ratty deep boxes that you can't use anymore that maybe are a little bit rotten, perfect swarm traps. All right, any questions for Kevin or for me? I have a question okay. on the uh, swarm commander. Um, does it yes. expire? I, I'm sure that it does. It doesn't have an expiration date on it. What I do um, when I get it is I put the date on it because I have some from last year. I bought some more this year. Um, I wouldn't let it get too old. How old is too old? I don't know, but I'm sure it does degrade. I think the stuff that we have is two years old now. I kind of feel like it doesn't expire. I think it's a lot like a lemongrass extract and extracts, they hold their potency for quite some time. But, you know, the bottom line is if you spray it and it doesn't have that lemony fresh scent, then maybe you need to consider buying a new one. Yeah, I think that's a good way to go. Trust your nose. Just don't use pledge. Sometimes. Actually, there's a lot of people who do use plates. Yeah, a lot of people that do. <laughs> Does it work? Yes. Yeah. You think that with petroleum in it. Yeah. Whatever it is, it, it does work. I've heard people say you don't buy Swarm Commander because it's very expensive. Oh, God, yeah. Interesting. Huh. Hmm. I know from Better B, I buy little pre-dosed ampules. Right. Um, that's another snap them open and, yeah they're pre-dosed it's pretty cool mm -hmm. just to address if you have a concern yeah. about overusing it yeah. yeah some people will uh will put it on a q-tip and put it in a uh, plastic bag a little sandwich bag with mm -hmm. some holes in it so you need to you need to re <clears throat> excuse me. you need to refresh your swarm lures every two mm -hmm. weeks <laughs> you can also use anise oil or oh, anise yes. extract Put it yeah, on the cotton swab in the back of the swarm strap. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, Alex. so wait, that's a good point, Bob. So you're not putting it up and just walking away. You're you're refreshing the pheromone of, um, every two weeks. Okay. Yep. Yeah. But anise is uh, the bees love anise. They do. <laughs> that's a great one if you uh, if you don't have any swarm other swarm lore. So mm -hmm. thanks, Alice. So one of the things you'll note when you put a swarm trap out, and I, you know, I don't know how many of you have been down this path. Grant Stiles sells his nukes in a nuke box and you end up with them somewhere. I take them and I put them out on a hive stand. And I caught four swarms last year on my property and never drove out the driveway from those things. Now I live near where Schaefer does all his beekeeping and he has 50 or 60 hives over there. So I don't know if they're mine or his, but that being said, uh, you know, you do have to keep an eye on them. When you walk out, you'll see bees inspecting them uh, going in and out They're They're prepping mm -hmm. to report back what the capability of them is. If you don't see bees inspecting and move them, put them someplace where the bees can find them. I had one down in the front of my property. The bees never looked at it. I always walked over and checked them. If you leave them in a place where the bees never visit them, the wax moth move in and they yep. eat your comb. Yep. So you want the bees to find them and be in them. If they're in them, the wax moth won't eat your stuff. Great. Thank you. You can go to the resource section of our website and look at the gadget garage and there's information there about building a bee vacuum too mm -hmm. that bob supplied 